Yeah. If we're in business, everything, the sound's coming through good? I'm waiting to hear them. Okay. <clears throat> I'll just said there, that's better. So apparently your change must have fixed whatever yeah. it was, Elijah. Thank you. Okay, well, we're glad to see, uh, glad to hear things are kind of coming together. The audio is set to the... Kind of a slow start here this morning. We've got uh, kind of icy, drizzly, rainy weather on the East Coast. And uh, since we're at a higher, higher elevation, that means ice, uh, potential for ice for us, which we had this morning, but it looks like temperature's gone up to about 36. Anyway, great to have you here. Hope you had a great Thanksgiving. We, uh, of course, had a wonderful time, had uh, bunches of people over at my daughter's house <coughs> and uh, had a wonderful meal, of course, and fellowship. And, uh, Dan says good morning to everyone. Yeah. Good Ingrid morning. Says good morning. Good morning. So. Anyway, it's time for us to go ahead and get started, and so we're glad that you're with us. If you're joining us online, we're glad you guys are here. Probably fill up a little more for, by lunchtime. But at any rate, let me just uh, ask you to pause a sec and then we'll go to prayer. Father, we want to thank you and praise you for who you are. And uh, we had a wonderful <coughs> day Thursday with the family. But every day we should be thanking you for your many blessings. And so we want to take the time to do that just now. Uh, there is no way that we can ever think to repay for all the many blessings that come. Um, so, Father, we're asking that you would in, <clears throat> infuse your spirit into our hearts and minds that we might simply live the exemplary life mm -hmm. that you called us to live as Christians, follow your example in Scripture, that others might see and your name might be glorified. So accomplish that in us is our prayer. Bless us today as we open your book. Help us as we uh, conclude with Revelation and also uh, with Elijah's study. And uh, we do ask that you use us in the finishing of your great work. We know you're coming soon. So prepare us for that, that hour. We ask in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen and amen. 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 Okay, so I guess... Uh, what we'll do is go ahead and get started with our story, and we're finishing up a chapter. Okay, finishing up a chapter, and this story, uh, piercing the darkness, Frank Peretti's this book. Present darkness. This present book, piercing uh, the current darkness. Yeah. Well, the second book was called piercing the darkness. <laughs> piercing the darkness. <laughs> present darkness was the first. Well, book. piercing the darkness is so much catchier. Yeah. It's like hard to think about. You know. I know. Anyway, the, uh, the, book, the, the books that he wrote were about the angelic warfare that really is all about us all the time. We're just oblivious to it. And uh, it's uh, quite revealing, even though this is written as, as fiction, as a fictional book. It really is something very real that happens all around us. Chilly morning today. Yeah. Dampness in the air. Okay. Hank had the lights on in the house, but he thought his eyes must be playing tricks on him because the room still looked very dark, the shadows deep. Sometimes he couldn't tell if it was himself moving or the shadows in the room. There was a strange undulating motion and the light and shadows made the depths of the house shift back and forth like the slow, steady motion of breathing. He stood in the doorway between the kitchen and living room, watching and listening. He thought he could feel a wind moving through the house, not a cold one from outside. It was like hot, sticky breath, laden with repulsive odors, close and impressive. He had discovered the clatter in the kitchen was due to a spatula sliding off the drain board and onto the floor. That should have calmed his nerves right down, but he still felt terrified. He knew he would sooner or later have to move into the living room and have a look. He took his first step out of the doorway and into the room and it was like falling into a bottomless well of blackness and terror. The hairs on his neck bristled as if with static electricity, and his lips started spilling out a frantic prayer. He fell down. Before he even knew what was happening, his body pitched forward and slammed into the floor. He felt like a trapped animal, instinctively struggling, trying to get loose from the unseen, crushing weight that held him. His arms and legs were smacking into furniture and knocking things over. 
but in his terror and shock he felt no pain. He squirmed and twisted and gasped for breath and lashed out at whatever it was, feeling resistance against the motion of his arms like stroking through water. The room seemed like it was filled with smoke, a blackness like blindness, a loss of hearing, loss of contact with the real world, time was standing still. He thought he could feel himself dying. An image or a hallucination or a vision or a real sight broke through for an instant. Two ghastly yellow eyes filled with hate. His throat compressed, squeezing shut. Jesus, he heard his mind cry out, help me. His next thought, a tiny instant flash, must have come from the Lord. Rebuke it, you have the authority. Hank spoke the words, though he couldn't hear the sound of them. I rebuke you in Jesus' name. The crushing weight upon him lifted so quickly, Hank felt he would sail upwards from the floor. He filled his lungs with air and noticed he was now struggling against nothing. But the terror was still there, that black, sinister presence. He sat up halfway, drew another breath, and spoke it clearly and loudly. In the name of Jesus, I command you to get out of this house. Mary awoke with a jerk startled and half terrified by the sound of a multitude screaming in anguish and pain. She heard the cries, deafening at first, but they faded as if moving off into an unseen distance. Hank, she screamed. <clears throat> Meanwhile, Marshall roared like a savage and raised the bat high to strike down his attacker. The attacker screamed also out of stark terror. It was Kate. They had unknowingly backed into each other in the dark hallway. <laughs> Marshall, she exclaimed, that her voice was quivering. She was close to tears and angry at the same time. What on earth are you doing out here? Kate Marshall sighed, feeling like a punctured inner tube. What are you trying to do, get yourself killed? What's wrong? She was looking at the baseball bat and knew something was up. She clung to him in fear. Is there someone in the house? No, he muttered in a combination of relief and disgust. Nobody. I looked. Well, what happened? Who was it? Nobody, I said, but I thought you were talking to someone. He looked at her with utmost impatience and said with steadily building volume, do I look like I've been having a friendly chat with someone? <laughs> Kate shook her head. I must have been dreaming, but it was the voices that woke me up. What voices? Marshall, it sounded like a New Year's Eve party in there. Come on, who was here? Nobody, there wasn't anybody here. I looked. Kate was very flustered. I know I was awake. You heard ghosts. He could feel her hand squeezing the blood out of his arm. Don't talk like that. Well, Sandy's gone. What do you mean gone? Gone where? She's gone. Her room's empty and she's not in the house. She's poof, gone. Kate hurried down the hall and looked in Sandy's room. Marcia followed and observed from the doorway as Kate checked the room over, looking through the closet and some of her drawers. She reported with alarm. Some of her clothes are gone. Her school books are missing. She looked at him helplessly. Marshall, she's left home. He looked back at her for a long moment, then around the room, and then rested his head against the door jamb with a quiet thud. Nuts, he said. I knew she wasn't herself today. I should have found out what was wrong. Well, we didn't hit it off too well today. Well, that was obvious. You came home without her. Well, how did she get home anyway? Her girlfriend, Terry, brought her. Maybe she went over to Terry's for the night. Should we call and find out? I don't know. You don't know. Marshall closed his eyes and tried to think. No, it's late. Either she's there or she isn't. If she isn't, we'll get them out of bed for nothing. And if she is, well, she's okay anyway. Kate seemed a little panicked and said, I'm going to call. Marshall held up his hand and leaned against the door jam again and said, hey, don't get all spooked now, all right? Give me just a minute. Well, I just want to see if she's there. All right, all right. But Kate could see something was very wrong with Marshall. He was pale and weak and shaken. What's the matter? Well, give me a minute. And she put her arm around him, concerned, and said, what is it? He had quite a struggle getting it out. I'm scared. He was trembling a bit, his eyes closed, and his head resting against the door jam. And he said, I'm really scared, and I don't know why. Well, that scared Kate. Marshall, she said, well, don't get upset, will you? Keep it level. Can I do anything? Just be tough, that's all. And Kate thought for a moment, well, why don't you get your robe on and I'll warm you some milk, okay? And he said, yeah, that would be great. So that's where we're <coughs> going to stop for this segment. Mm -hmm. yeah.
So that takes us to another. We're in the middle of the chapter. Middle These are all broken into segments by whatever scenes they're I going to. So. Okay. All right, very good. And of course, uh, one of the reasons why we, just a reminder, why we stream our service. And we call it a service, but uh, really it's just a Bible study, people coming together into the family room here. But one of the reasons why we, we stream it is because we want to show people how easy it is really just to do what we're doing here. There are a lot of people in the, in the country that are <clears throat> kind of unchurched or done with church. And, um, and of course, God still has as his hand on their lives and uh, so they need they need just a regular routine and what we have found is if you don't really schedule Bible study time um, you end up the time gets absorbed and pre you get preoccupied doing other things and there's so many so many of us <clears throat> lead such busy lives and so it's important to schedule uh, a time when you can sit down I mean you want to study and read the Bible personally but uh, come together and have a group, and you can do that over almost any weekend. So we want to encourage that. It's pretty simple to do, and pretty casual. We don't we don't have a big organ playing. We don't have uh, people marching in. You know, we don't have deacon seating people and that kind of thing. It's just pretty. No casual. frills. Yeah. <laughs> the important thing is really God's word. And what we we've been studying the Book of Revelation for some time now, and we've come to chapter 22, and before Elijah comes with his study this morning, what I wanted to do is just really re-emphasize <clears throat> the context of the book of Revelation. Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and read through 22. 22 is, uh, of course, the chapters and the verses were added by, uh, they're not necessarily inspired like the content is. Um, but what's interesting is that the book itself, the whole book, is framed in a six to one ratio as we have discussed over the last year. And chapter 22 is kind of outside of that framing uh, from the standpoint that it's just summarizing um, <clears throat> and adding a warning uh, to those that actually read, read the book. So let me go through and read it and then I want to talk about the context just for a few minutes. Okay, so John starts out, uh, and he showed me a pure river of, of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of its street, of course, we, the last chapter was talking about the holy city, the new Jerusalem. And so that's here already. In the middle of its street and on either side of the river was, a, was the tree of life, which bore twelve fruits, each tree uh, yielding its fruit every month. Uh, and the leaves, of course, of the tree are, were for the healing of the nations. Now, you know, when we think of a tree, we think of something relative to what we can look out the window and see. But, but how many redeemed are there? How, how many people have access to this tree? An um, um, <coughs> unnumberable multitude. Yeah, we're talking probably, if we had to put a count on it, mm. probably millions of people are have access to this tree. So we're not talking about some normal tree, are we? We're talking about a tree that uh, in the middle of its street and on either side of the river. And we're not talking about a normal river here either. This is a river uh, of life. In fact, we talked last week about the base of the city, right? And how God's throne was kind of like the capstone of this, uh, this pyramid-shaped city. But it's four square at the base, and the base is how big do we say it was? 300 by 300. Because, yeah, 900 square miles. So that's a little bit of room to put a tree in. <laughs> this is going to be one huge, tremendous tree that uh, with branches extend. I mean, yeah, the branches might extend out for so be more like a 20 vineyard or like a bush. Yeah, the branches might extend out for 20 miles or something, you know? Doesn't it grow on both sides? Yeah, it does. It grows on both sides. So you can imagine growing and expanding that far? Yeah, I mean, this is going to be like no tree that anybody has ever really seen or even imagined. Um, and just I think our kids enjoyed going to the river to swim. You can imagine having a rope swing off of a tree like that. Wow, <laughs> unbelievable. 
I'd say this will be able to handle maybe 100,000 rope slings, <laughs> something like that. Who knows? You know, maybe that's where we get, like, I feel like in a lot of old legends and mythology and stuff, there seems to be this idea of this very massive, majestic tree that's, like, bigger than every other tree. And it's very, uh, like, I don't know how to describe it other than that, but if you watch, like, a lot of different things, it seems to be prominent in different stories. Yeah. Massive this idea. Yeah, I don't, even, I don't even know if John could see the whole thing, to be honest with you. Um, I think he saw enough that he could identify it as a tree. And of course, the angel probably told him, you know, it bears fruit every month, that kind of thing. And, and of course, God's people were told in Isaiah 65, Talk 66, we're talk, in Isaiah 65, we're told that we come together. There, there are two identifiable uh, meeting times that we come together, and that's monthly and also weekly in the uh, in the New Jerusalem. Do you come together yearly? Uh, I suspect that we probably will have similar. The only thing Scripture says is from one new moon to another and one Sabbath to well, another. I mean, I guess the, I guess the concept of years will go away because you know there's no point to. Yeah, who's counting? Yeah. Right. Who's counting? Well, I mean, stuff like Jubilee and different things that were. Kind of like an annual and of course, thing. if 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 we go back to if this becomes the center, are we still of, celebrating the Passover in heaven? If we, if, well, I think that probably we will for for eternity. There'll be some commemoration of of, of what happened. Um, so, <clears throat> and it's interesting that we're also talking about a river of life. Which is something, it doesn't say a pure river, it says a river of life. So even the river, the water must have some special uh, life sustaining. Benefits. Water is alkalinized. You say water, just in general, is water, is you know, water of life. Exactly. Mm -hmm. I understand that, but I'm saying the fact that he calls it a river, of, a river of life, that's a little different than just saying there was a crystal river flowing through. He calls it yeah. a river of life, so there's something special. Yeah, maybe it's also just teeming with life. Like you see and all sorts of other stuff in it. It says in verse 3 there that uh, there should be no more curse, but the throne of God and the <coughs> Lamb shall be in it, and His servants shall serve Him. So a whole dynamic change in store for the redeemed. Um, the atmosphere is going to be different. The, the, the topography is going to be different. The, the things that we eat much healthier, of course, and this is why we grow. Strong's Concordance ties the uh, water of life to a fullness of living, and it ties it to oh, springs of living water. Yeah. And living water um, is, for example, spring water is moving. considered living water, moving. so it's moving and it's, it sustains life as opposed to stagnant water, which right. doesn't sustain. Yeah. It says they will see God's face, and His name shall be on our foreheads. And there'll be no night there. They need no lamp nor light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. So, <clears throat> so quite a different experience than what we're used to now. Yeah, that's pretty interesting too, because I actually get to see his face. Yeah. You know, which just kind of speaks to some of the things that will change, like our, well, for one, you know, our physical ability to stand in his presence. Um, without being vaporized. <laughs> right. Do you think that's because we're so much more, we're so much less than what we were in the beginning? Well, there's no darkness in us, and so there's nothing for the light to, to pierce and destroy. Well, light that destroys just, darkness. I mean, just thinking of like the development of our eyes, like we'll have essentially the ability to stare directly into the sun <laughs> in both senses of the word. <laughs> yeah, well, Part of, the, part of the growing up process might enable us to do that, for sure. It's interesting that this concept keeps coming up about having a name in the forehead, mm -hmm. uh, the sign of the, the mark of the beast in the right hand of the forehead. It's, you know, are we going to have actually like a tattoo or, mm -hmm. you know? It's like living it out and like, a, like thinking the way Christ does. It's, it's about like your mind being the same as Christ's. But but John saw this in vision. What did he see? Did he see mm -hmm. us having some kind of symbol on our foreheads? Or, and technically, the forehead in Scripture is the space between the eyes, not above the, the eyes. 
kind of interesting. So the name of God will be in our foreheads. Yeah. Or maybe we maybe we'll wear crowns that have the name on them or something. Maybe that's what it is. <coughs> I mean, we know that the foreheads are the, the location of the frontal lobe and the conscience. <coughs> But you know, everything else John's describing is literal. So it's not fair to spiritualize that one concept. In the next verse when the angel says to him, uh, these words are faithful and true. What words is he referring to? When he's describing heaven and all that? Reason. Just thinking, I can tell she's thinking. What verse are you looking at? Verse, verse six. six. The angel said to John, you know, these words are faithful and true. <clears throat> I mean, I don't, I don't he think, hasn't said anything yet. No, so. I take a long, I mean, I think he's talking about the whole book. All of it. The whole mm -hmm. book is faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show his servants the things which must shortly take place. So he, he, that, that right there is a direct quotation from chapter 1. See, this is, this is kind of coming full circle now. Right? He's just summarizing. He's adding a bit about you know, the tree of life and whatnot, but then he's coming full circle back to chapter 1. I don't know. I can't, I, maybe he's talking about what he's getting ready to say. Behold, I'm coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of these of this book. So he's talking about the book collectively, the whole thing. Okay. <clears throat> so now I, John, saw and heard these things, the whole thing. And when I heard and saw, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel who showed me these things. So I, I think he's he's uh, he might be getting in this summary here. And who knows how long, I mean, it just says he was in the spirit on the Lord's day. I mean, did God give him the whole thing in one day that he recorded, or did, was it over a course of time? But obviously, he's getting a bit of a summary here. It would be one intense dream to I mean, have seen all of that in one night, yeah. or one set month long vision. Yeah. Which would, would have been possible. Not, I, don't, it's a, I don't think it's unreasonable to have a dream, and, because I mean, I've had dreams that I felt like they were days. Yeah. You know, you don't have a concept of time in dreams, you just have a concept of this happened this time, that time, that time. I've also had dreams where I felt like I continued previous dream. Yeah. Where I recognized that I had dreamed this before, and was in that same place, but not the same time. It was a very funny thing, like yeah. a continuing scene that I was conscious that I was had dreamed this before. So, so John is overwhelmed, obviously, by the things that he's heard and the mm -hmm. things that he's seen. He falls down to worship before the feet of the angel who's showing him these things. And of course the angel says, See that you do not do that, for I am your fellow servant, and of your brethren the prophets, and of those who keep the words of mm -hmm. this book. And of course, you know, the command, worship God. So, so again, this is, a, this is a repeat of what occurred in chapter 19, basically. So he refers to himself as a fellow servant and of his brethren, the prophets. So he's an angel. Yeah. He's an angel? Mm -hmm. But like, wouldn't that also be an expression like another prophet would use? Or is this just... Like, well, like, up like here, an angel up, well, of course the word angel only means messenger, so right. you don't really know. There's no clear definition. Right. We've just, because we've seen the word angel, we use that, but it may be, could be almost anybody, I guess, among the renamed. But I, I thought, too, he says that these sayings are faithful and true, and the Lord God of the Holy Prophets sent his angel to show his servants the things must shortly be done. And then the next words he says, Behold, I come quickly. Well, that, that would be the words of Jesus, not the words of an angel. Yeah. So the angel is coming to deliver this yeah. message. Jesus sent this message, Behold, I come quickly. You know, so I think maybe that's what the, these sayings are faithful and true. That's part of what he's, he's saying, that... I'm coming quickly. Behold, blessed is he that keeps the sayings of the prophecy of this book. And he says to me, do not seal the, the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. And when, when did we see that phrase? When, when was the first time that we saw that phrase? Back in Daniel? The, first, the very first chapter, verse 3. 
Revelation or Daniel? Revelation. Okay. Revelation 1. But have we also seen Daniel's prophecy talking about seal up the book? Right, we did. Yeah. But this one he says, for the time don't the seal it. Right, so Which so means Daniel, Revelation is for the end times. Dan, yeah, see, that's my point. Daniel said seal it up to the time of the end. He's saying the same thing, that don't seal the book. And then, of course, he, he repeats himself. He's summarizing again for the time is at hand, which is a repeat of chapter 1, verse 3, right? He that readeth and they that, <clears throat> that do these things, you know, for the time is at hand. So the very next verse is a verse that a lot of people are familiar with, which is a statement where probation is closed. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He was holy, let him be holy still. So there's this decoration including all four, category, all four categories of humanity that exist at the time when probation closes. What are those four categories? This is, this is, a, this is a, a general closing of probation <coughs> of all four categories of humanity at that moment. They so would be... Unjust, filthy... Righteous just, and holy. Okay, and what are, what are the four categories that, that those those descriptions relate to? Would be the wicked dead, the righteous dead, the wicked living, and the righteous living. Okay. <clears throat> so it's a it's a total final closing encompassing all of humanity, both living and dead. And when John says don't seal the pro words of the prophecy of this book for the time is at hand. And then he gives this final declaration of the close of probation. We know that that's the context. The whole book of Revelation, as Rose just mentioned, specifically, specifically in real time, is dealing with the very, the very scenes at the end. Okay? Now, prophetically, prophetically, when you, when you consider prophetic time, you're talking about including things that happened in history since the first century. Right? John is writing in the first century. And so things start to happen uh, uh, first century that, that Revelation re refers to prophetically. But we're looking back, and of course we're, we're dealing with now real time when he talks about the time, uh, the time is at hand. Specifically, the close of probation. That, that's the, the main focus in the book of Revelation is that moment between the first plagues, which we call the trumpets, the sounding of the trumpets, and the last seven plagues, <clears throat> or those bowls that are poured out. That moment, that focal point uh, where probationary time is closed is really where the book of Revelation is really pointing to. That's the time that he's referring to here. But the time is at hand. Probation is about to close. Okay? People miss that. They throw everything back in history or they throw everything into the future. That's exactly what the devil wants them to do. Doesn't want it to understand that we're dealing with real time here at the end. The things that the book the, the, the things that the book identify are just before us. The sounding of the trumpets, yeah, we can make application, right, of things that happen in history. But in real time, they're just in front of us. Just in front of us. Okay? <clears throat> and I wanted to point that out. Uh, the rest of the book, the, the next verse, Behold, I'm coming quickly. My reward is with me to give every man, <clears throat> everyone according to his work. I'm the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. That all goes back, again, to the first chapter. All these, all these things are just pointing back to the very first chapter, indicating that this is a summary of, bringing us full circle from where it started. Blessed are those who do His commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life, and may enter through the gates into the city. Outside are dogs and sorcerers, <clears throat> and whoremongers, and murderers, and idolaters, and whosoever loves and practices a lie. I, Jesus, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. I'm the root and the offspring of David, the bright morning star. And the Spirit and the Bride say, Come, and let him who hears say, Come, and let him who thirsts come. Whosoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. <clears throat> and then, of course, he goes on with a warning 
to those that take away or add to the commentary of this book. All right? um, and we find many people doing that today. We find many people saying, oh, you know, the church is raptured out of here after the fourth chapter, so the rest of it we don't have to worry about. They've taken away the majority of the book. The most important parts of the book, of course it's all important, but, but the very detailed aspects of the book, a lot of people just throw, throw it aside. You know? And then other people, when they, when they try to throw things into the distant, uh, far distant future, they're adding all kinds of things to that scenario as well. I think that, that mm -hmm. text in itself is a clear commentary about society reaching the point by the end of time with a total lack of reverence and respect for holy things. Yeah. Because, you know, this that's a very, what he says of what he will do, you know, if you, you, take, you add unto these things, God will add unto him the plagues that are written. Sure. If you take away from the words of this book, they'll take away your part out of the book and out of the holy city. Right. You know, th this is like, this is, this is a game changer. This is not just probation closing. This is saying you have to have respect. I mean, this is all about worship. Yeah. You know, the, the message to, this, to the churches, the, the three angels' messages, is all about worship. What authority you really align yourself with. And the issue yeah. in the garden at the beginning was really was about, about worship, yeah. trust, and trust. respect yeah. for, for the Word of God. Mm -hmm. And at the end, that issue was first and foremost. Right. You Who know? are you faithful to? Who do you trust? He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming quickly. Amen. Even so come Lord Jesus for the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And John ends with, uh, be with you all. Amen. So the important thing that uh, we need to understand is that um, the book of Revelation is based on a 6 to 1 ratio. You have three of those. You have the focus, greater focus on Christ and His ministry and an understanding of what involves the atonement what the atonement really involves in the plan of salvation. <clears throat> and then you have the trumpets, the sounding of the trumpets. You have those, those chapters, and then you have the sounding of the plagues and the things that follow with the millennium and the holy city. And it's structured that way. Um, <clears throat> and there are many applications that we can make in history, but we're living now in real time. And that's what the book of Revelation is really focusing on the time of the end, those that uh, will live through and experience what the book is revealing. And so there needs to be, above all, spiritual preparation for that, and then as much physical preparation as, as humanly possible. Ultimately, that trust issue will be the dominant thing, because everything will be stripped away from us. Everything will be stripped away eventually, and the only thing that you'll have left will be your faith, your trust in God's Word to carry you through, to be with you always, even to the end. And uh, it's not going to seem like you're going to survive. <coughs> it's not going to seem that way, like any of us would survive. But God's Word is sure. God's Word is true. You know, something that, um, I forget exactly why or when this thought occurred to me, but it was a while back, thinking of the things that we'll go through and um, how it related to Christ's experience, you know, part of what Christ did before he um, entered ministry was he went to the wilderness and he fasted for 40 days. And, um, you know, of course we see that theme repeated with a few other figures in the Bible. I guess Moses being one of the other prominent ones, and was Elijah another one, technically? Yeah. Yeah? Um, he was translated without seeing without death. Seeing death. But the one thing that was an interesting thought to me, because I forgot how long we thought the time of trouble might last, was it maybe, could be three years, kind of you were thinking? It seems like there's a seven year cycle um, there at the end. Also, we find that in Daniel's prophecies, uh, a cycle of seven years, where, again, very difficult times. God's people endure very difficult times. Um, of course, the three had. The three and a half years. There's a three and a half year period that's focused on prophetically, and also I believe that will also be real time. So we may have uh, may have a seven year period when the when the trumpets actually start to sound, and when you remember the fifth trumpet, when that sounds, Satan kind of steps in to uh, 
uh, in a very real way uh, with his demons to, to basically persecute and destroy those who resist his authority. So. <coughs> but anyway, we'll see how, just how it plays out. I don't think anybody has all of the insight. Um, it would be too overwhelming. So we'll just see how it all plays out. But we know enough of the general detail to know that we need to spiritually be ready, most of all, and then as much as possible physically ready to be part of the solution instead of part of the problem. Well, just to round out that thought that I was making was that um, I just thought it would be interesting if one of the final things that we end up having to endure, or whoever, you know, the 144,000, um, part of what they have to endure <laughs> would be, um, you know, horses over there freaking out. I would be too. But um, uh, it would be interesting if part of what we had to go through was actually like, um, what I would consider to be a complete self-denial of self in the way of maybe even having to go through our own 40-day fast. Wilderness experience. Yeah, where, and maybe that's count like the on final the piece experience. of it. But I'm just thinking maybe that's like the final piece of it because, I mean, um, just thinking of how our lives have to line up so well with Christ that maybe that's like the final thing is like, are you completely committed to this? to the point where you consider me more valuable than food, yeah. you know. He says our bread and water will be sure, but that, that's about it. Oh, but he is also our bread and water. Of course. So, like, yeah, whether that's I mean, literal that, or whether that's... It may be spiritually know. and physically. Yeah. <clears throat> so. At any rate, um, we hope you enjoyed our series on the book of Revelation. I think we've been in there for over a year now, so which is fine. That's just the way Scripture is. But if you have any questions or thoughts, please uh, send them our way. Um, you didn't get much time for Elijah with this. You got to have enough time to do your study? I uh, can get, get started on it. Okay, and you can work on it next week. Yeah, it doesn't matter. I, no, I, I, just, I just don't want you to feel like, <laughs> yeah, we have, I don't want you to feel like you've got to do it all in one No, there's no way we could burst. do it all in one, one burst. Okay. okay. Did you want to come over here? I can just come sit next to you or something. It doesn't matter. Or wherever. Or someplace. <clears throat> okay. Someplace. Sit by mom. It's fine. Yeah. We don't have designated seating here. Whatever's, whatever's comfortable. So we'll break into a little bit of this one, um, which I guess is kind of uh, complementary to what we've been talking about with Revelation, um, and just that it deals with, like, what I wanted to look into was um, exactly what type of people we should be, um, you know, like what our responsibilities are, and uh, looking at that on a more personal level. Um, and more specifically, I was studying specifically on the idea of what a man should be, but I think all of those characteristics are, for the most part, um, you know, universal. So, um, let's see where to start here. Uh, I guess start just by thinking of, um, you know, who are some of the, the great men of history that we can think of? You mean biblical history or overall history? Secular history? Um, secular, biblical, it's all history. Great how? Well, then that's kind of where <laughs> the question is going is like, you know, because we can all think of people who accomplished magnificent things or wonderful things or people who just had accomplishments. You know, you think of like Plato or Aristotle or former, you know, philosophers who have left their mark on history well, and are considered, yeah. yeah. Well, see, I would think of somebody like President. Nikola Tesla. Yeah, Tesla. Yeah. You know, these are people who have um, left quite an impression on history in different ways. And, um, you know, we consider them good or great men for a number of different reasons. Yeah. And uh, <coughs> then I kind of wanted to <coughs> cross that with how we view uh, biblically great men. You know, yeah, when so. you started talking about great men, my mind is beginning to go through just the local, the, the regional history that we've grown up with, you know. and. I read biographies to you guys when you were little about great men in history, but they were inventors and um, they gave us the light bulb. They yeah, gave us the this. light bulb and the, the, and the, the telephone, telephone and yeah. all, all of these different things. And yet, when you get into the real history of who those men actually were, they are less than exemplary people that you'd want your children to emulate. Yeah, like Edison, just being a, a ruthless businessman, basically stealing from everybody. 
sure. from the light bulb to everything else. <laughs> and some of the ones that you that don't consider consider phenomenally great, like Tesla, who died in poverty, poverty and obscurity, people who was absolutely brilliant, brilliant and wanted to give the world the gift of uh, free electricity and um, free uh, transmission energy, sure. of energy. Yeah, he yeah. really wanted to give all of those things to the world and the world stole those things from him and, and because they, away. they could see they could make a profit from it. Somebody could make a profit off of it. So greatness is one of those <clears throat> things that what the world considers great, the reality is that it's we not. shouldn't consider any of them great. Yeah. Yeah. So. so then who are, some, who are some biblically great men we can think of? Or biblically great people in general? Jesus. <laughs> I go on straight for number one. <laughs> Yeah, the widow who gave two mites. Wow. Don't even know her name. <laughs> I guess we will in heaven. Yeah. But everybody's heard about her. Yeah. Moses you know, we heard about you. Well, but I'm saying it was like, it was what you were, it was what you were talking about earlier. Here's somebody who gave their all. Yeah. Yeah. But we don't even know her name. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But we know what she did. She gave her all. And, you know, I, I think that might even be part of the point. Um, is that if we knew who she was, there might be this element of praise to her specifically. Right, we put her on a pedestal. We'd be like, wow, well, look at her. She gave everything. Yeah. Right. Well, I mean, <laughs> like, well, I mean, like, it's the same thing with, like, Mary for giving birth to Jesus. People worship Mary over God now. Yeah, even, True, though, even though she was trying to, like, talk Jesus down and, you know, like, he was out speaking and they wanted to speak with him and probably be like, you know, you should be quiet. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, even though there's the Savior, Emmanuel, right there, it was a very typical family in a lot of ways. Well, in some ways untypical because Joseph was a lot older than Mary. But he did have brothers and sisters, I'm sure. And he did have responsibilities and things to do. And yeah. But, of course, he, he was still always the Son of God. Yeah, and it said, well, it said that yeah. even his own family thought he was possessed. Yeah, just, and, yeah a little bit off. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. and so they hear they have this miracle child, yet, you know, they... So, I mean, it just shows how how everyone is really a normal person. We all have our flaws, and we all have our, you know, our things, and, you know, it's not worth worshiping those people. Now, so, you, so greatness would have to be, biblical greatness would have to be defined as somebody who's fo following after the example of Christ. In fact, Paul said, "The man who carried die, the cross at the crucifixion died to self. Mm -hmm. That's what that's what success really is: is dying to self." Yeah, I mean, God had to take Moses and put him in the wilderness for forty years to unteach him. The first for, for the first forty years that he, he was infected with, you know, all of the Egyptian philosophy. So you know, get him, take take all of that away, and then I can use him. And he's a lowly shepherd, not a not a you know not a, a general in the Egyptian army, you know, in line to the Pharaoh's throne. But let's strip him of all that, put him in the wilderness with some sheep, let him deal with the sheep for a while, and, and see how you, you mean, feel about being a great mighty. Yeah, it's general. like it's like Joseph. Joseph went from having a really nice family and being the favorite of the family to being praised by his parents to having nothing at all. Um, he was kind of despised by most of the most well, of Well, most, most of his brothers, but he was praised Not by his favorite. parents. the favorite. <laughs> yeah. Well, he was the favorite, favorite of his, his father. father. <laughs> by his dad. By his dad was his favorite. Yeah. And look where that got him. Yeah. Well, that's what I mean. He was his father's favorite, and then, his, and then he ended up being yeah. they taken to nothing, and then he achieved even greater stuff. Yeah. Tell you, what a story that is, though, that he was his father's favorite, and he ends up second in command to the highest position in the world. Essentially, at that time, yeah. you know, but it was the trial of that experience of being sold into slavery and, and betrayed by his own brothers mm -hmm. that changed him and humbled him because he was a spoiled, petted, oh, rich yeah. kid. Right. When he was when he was sold by his brothers. Many colors and yeah. he was yeah, he no. was he was a bit of, a little bit arrogant and <clears throat> the brothers didn't like the fact that he was going to tattle on them every time they did something wrong. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we, we forget, we, we look at Joseph at the end and say, man, what a great example of character. But it was those trials that changed his character. And that was kind of the, <clears throat> the, the lead-in question with even more of this was, were these men always so great? Or was it something that was cultivated in everyone, um, you know, throughout their lives? Look at David, and that's definitely not true. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, right. all of these people... As far as I can tell, we're not born with greatness, you know, in them. 
other than Jesus. Yeah. I, I would say somebody that somebody's life that really um, outside of John the Revelator, who we just focused on because of what he accomplished at the end. <clears throat> but um, Daniel, at a very young age, was stripped away from his family, carted off to Babylon. Probably about the same age that Joseph was. Probably I mean, 17, 18 he's, years yeah, old. Yeah, he's probably just a teenager. <clears throat> carted off with his, fortunately, with some friends. You know, and... Uh, and Daniel was probably part of the royal family because that's what Nebuchadnezzar did, was he chose the young members of the royal family to bring to his, his uh, royal cabinet right. to help keep the people in line. For, for right. some, some now, there were 10,000 captives mm -hmm. that were actually taken to Babylon as a result of that. He was just one of 10,000. But he was, we believe, part of the royal family and raised, raised of course, as a Hebrew. Because Nebuchadnezzar only took the good, right. the good ones. But he... Not only did he have just an inherent brilliance, but God was blessing him as well because of his recognition of the, God, the, the true God. Yeah. And so God, so God used him the rest of his life once he got to Babylon. I think. But we also forget what he endured. You know, when they were taken into captivity, they weren't given a cushy um, life. You know, if they'd been part of the royal family in Israel when they were taken captive. Being sold into slavery was a horrible lot to get in your life, and it could have made him bitter against God. Right. But he recognized that the only hope he could have was in God. And, and he eventually determined to put his trust in God's faith. And according to chapter nine, or I mean, he eventually realized, or chapter maybe six or seven, he eventually realized reason for their captivity, the seventy-year captivity. He talks about that. So he, did, he said, I understand why, you know, I understand why I'm here and why so what's going on. <clears throat> but uh, um, for him to, I mean, I mean, he was going to be cat food at one, with, with one point. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, <clears throat> so, I mean, you know, he did go through some, some really tremendous trials. We also forget that the, the ones that were made part of Pharaoh's household were made eunuchs. Right. So he had no to endure family. that ultimate humiliation, which in the scriptural canon would have left them out of the out of the congregation. Right. Anybody yeah. anybody who'd been made a eunuch was actually shut out of the couldn't congregation. Have, like, probably you couldn't have children. Right. Couldn't couldn't have a family. And so so for him, for all of those boys, their future was was almost as bleak as it could be because yet, for generations God, your future is in your children God and your grandchildren. Moved him up to the top. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and so and one of the interesting things that I've heard another guy present on when he was going through a study on Daniel was he was talking about the um, the spiritual preparation that must have been made to make Daniel the kind of young man that he was, and he said that um, you know because they knew from prophecy that this was going to happen, and so he said the way he figures it is that there must have been families who believed that this prophecy was going to come to pass and they were expecting it, so they spent time preparing their kids for this event. For the possibility. Yeah, for basically spiritually arming them, saying, like, here's what the Bible says, is, you know, here's what God said is going to happen to you, you know, and so here's what you should be expecting, you know, and, and training their kids to stand for God in the midst of that. Right, just like we're going through Revelation and saying this is not just something that happened in history, but it's going to be repeated, and we're going to go through it as well. And looking yeah. during the Reformation to the Waldensians, it said that they knew that the likelihood was that they would be persecuted and hunted down, and they knew that their lot for their children and their grandchildren was not going to be a, a happy one. They prepared their children to endure hardness and prepared them for the likelihood that standing for God would mean costing them their lives. And that's a really unusual <coughs> legacy. You know, how, how would you feel if you were being brought up by someone saying, you know, you're probably going to be hunted down and persecuted and killed. You're going to die a martyr's Welcome death. to the typical Adventist home. <laughs> <Martyr's death. laughs> well, I don't think that's typical anymore. I mean, Maybe not so much. Yeah, no, we just want everybody to tell everybody it's going to be hunky-dory. Yeah, don't, don't get all, you know, don't, don't get, get all, all excited flustered. about last day events. All right, don't get all flustered, you know. Don't, there's no urgency here. You know, I mean, that's, that's the typical message I think today. And we hear that in other denominations, too. Even those that believe we're coming into the last days, well, if they've got that secret rapture belief, 
hey, no big deal, we're going to leave before fact, it gets ugly. The, Adventist, the General Conference of the Adventist Church took the word imminent out of the, their charter. Like the imminent coming? The, the imminent, imminent coming return of Jesus. Yeah, right. they, they removed took that imminent out. out of there. Yeah. The last, last session. That's pretty sad. But I mean, it's also not unexpected. I mean, I think that that's directly where the Bible says things will go. Yeah. Is that everyone will be at this Ellen point. Ellen said that's where, that's where they would, in my books and my information would be considered of non-effect. They also did that at the last general conference session. So, there, I mean, what she said, it's all coming to pass in that regard. Yeah. And so for those who believe there's no reason to be getting alarmed or excited about last day events, you're just lulling people to sleep. Right. And that's a false prophet's mindset that's going to come back. It's just like them. the politicians telling us that, you know, the economy is just rolling along and it's doing wonderfully. Well, there's no rolling along and doing wonderfully when you're $22 trillion in debt, you know, as a nation. Not very Plus long. all of the private debt, you know. I mean, a trillion plus dollars in just student loan debt. I mean, this <laughs> is incredible. Well, even one of the young guys I was talking to, who knows very little about politics or anything like that, just says he gets the feeling that like there seems to be this thing going on in the U.S. where we're just pretending everything's fine. Right. And we're not willing to say the emperor's not wearing any clothes. Yeah. You know. But there's an elephant in the room. But it's interesting that, like, like this is someone who's not really, like, uh, well-versed in politics or anything. He's just, like, a young guy who, you know, is just looking around and saying, wow, like, this place looks like it's falling apart. And well, somehow most people, everyone's walking around yeah, like it's fine. Yeah, the media and, and, and most people are told, you know, take the red pill. So you're in la-la land. And don't take the blue pill. Which well, that, that's that also a reflection on what happened reality. in 1929 when the Great Depression hit. The government did everything it could to tell people that things were great. Right. In fact, the number one song they rolled out Happy days. was Happy Days Are Here, here Again. again. Right. You know, that, as if they could get the people in the mindset. So, yeah. And that's when motion pictures began to be a big deal. And people escaped from the reality. scariness of the reality by going into these movies. And then yeah. Hollywood began to influence people's mindset to think everything was going to be okay. Yeah, and the crash that's coming soon to our neighborhood is going to be vastly magnified compared to what happened in 33. Right. So this, probably, you're probably talking about a worldwide depression. A worldwide depression. Yeah, and you know, it all comes back to, to total reliance on God to, yeah. to carry you through that or to, to do whatever He has planned for you. Right. And, um, yeah. So, okay. So we've defined greatness is not necessarily who you are and your, the world and, and your upbringing and whatnot, but there's definitely a difference between secular greatness and biblical greatness. Well, and because um, we won't have a lot of time to get into most of the scriptures, which is why I figured we'd spend this first part just kind of talking about the intro to this idea. But, um, you know, one of the scriptures that comes to mind is it says there is not one good. You know, no, there not one good. Yeah, there's not one that serves God. There is not one that does. You know, it goes to this list, and um, all of our right doing, even, all of our rags. best intentions, are just considered filthy rags to God. Um, so, and so even in terms of just that, um, you know, the lead-in thought that I had was that really all we can possibly be are mirrors reflecting whoever we serve, whoever the the great one. Well, yeah, I, they, I they call Mark Levin the great one, but really, that's, <laughs> the, 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 he's he's really the the lesser great one. I mean, Christ was obviously the great one that has to be followed. I looked up greatness in uh, the concordance here, and it says it only occurs 32 times. And but greatness in almost every case is pointing to the greatness of God, not to the greatness of any human being. Right. And I think that greatness has to be defined as being connected with God. And That's the only source of any kind of greatness that really matters. Right, and in Hebrews chapter 1, Jesus claimed to be the caractere of his Father. Right? He was the, image. the express image of his Father. So here was the character of the Father in the flesh, in reality. And uh, we get our word character from that word express image in, 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 uh, in Greek. 
And being an image, for example, on a coin, we have an the impress. impression. Impression. An impression mm -hmm. of a face, you know, that has to be, that's that's the stamp of character there. Because yeah. there's a, an impression. So, so that, and he was the great one. Well, plus the, um, the other aspect of that is that we are made in the image of God. Right. You know. Originally, yes. Originally. Mm -hmm. And so. Adam um, was. And so just from that idea alone, like that's kind of the, the very first thought I wanted to draw on mm -hmm. was how, um, you know, we we simply reflect whoever we serve and that in terms of greatness, you know, we often view it in these different lights, but what's truly great is who we serve and that there is no inherent greatness <coughs> in us in, yeah, right. and in this world <laughs> as we see. I mean, everything here turns to junk, turns to chaos and... And all our righteousness is as filthy rags. It's like our solar yeah. system, you know, we see that in our, the example that our solar system, there's only one sun. All of the other planets can only reflect that light. So all the other planets, there, there's no, <coughs> if you take the sun there's away. There's no natural light of their own. Right, there's no natural light of their own. So they can only reflect the light. So you have one great ball or one great planet, if you want to call it the sun a planet. <coughs> the others are nothing without the sun. Just as we are nothing without the sun. I saw mm -hmm. so. Yeah, and, and you used this illustration before, but it always full pops moon. into mind. Full moon That's present. a full moon <coughs> and the new moon. Well, we had the full moon last night. And how, um, you know, the only time that we can't see the moon is when the earth gets in the way. way. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's right. You know, yeah, so uh, appropriate. So every month we have an example. Example in the heavens. Yes. Uh, yeah, of the what, heavens of declare what, the glory of God and the firmament that show us handiwork. Well, what's interesting too is you can take it even a step further and you can see almost a progression to how, um, I'll use the term the slippery slope works, is that you know you progressively shine less and less of that light the more the earth gets in the way. You know, so up to that point, the earth is, you still have light, so you can still see it and be like, oh, there's still light there, I'm fine, until there's just total darkness, and then you're wandering around going, where am I? <laughs> You know? yeah. and, uh, and that's what we're going to see at the very end, is we're going to see a generation where there is no gray area. <clears throat> You're going to have completely other. on the Lord's side or completely on the enemy's side, and we right. will see darkness in humanity like we've never seen it before. But we will also see the brightness of God's character and His goodness shining through His people in a way that hasn't been ever seen on this earth, too. Yeah, it's going to be a complete a division. Complete Eclipse. Yeah. So, so, um, so I guess that's pretty much the um, the intro there to what I wanted to talk about was how we, as God's people, can truly reflect that greatness, um, you know, in the in the more full sense. Yeah, I'm looking forward to the next week. Absolutely. <coughs> so, but I guess for now, what we'll do is we'll just close out in prayer and uh, pick it up next Sabbath. See what's what. <laughs> and it's good too because uh, you know Ken Ken wasn't here today, and other people um, will be able to pick it right up for the very spot. So that's good. Yeah, so we can just give a short summary <clears throat> and, and then uh, pick it up. All right, and Father, we thank you so much for this day, for the Sabbath, and for this time to be together, and for your word that you've left us to understand and to know these principles and. We ask that uh, as the next Sabbath comes around, that you would be with us and help us to understand the topic and the, uh, the subject more specifically, and that we would be able to reflect your character more beautifully and more perfectly. Lord, um, we know that we will need you more as time gets closer to your return, and so we ask that you would continue to guide us in that way and to build us up for your coming and uh, help, us to, uh, help us to exemplify your character. This I ask and pray in the name of your Son. Amen. <coughs> okay. Well, thank you for that. We're looking forward to that. Um, <coughs> this is going to be a great week. series. Yeah. But I bet you're going to have to go for a couple of months now. <coughs> well, that's what I'm... There's so <laughs> much material in this concept. <laughs> There's a lot. It's going to be a lot to, to discuss. There's a lot to talk about. Sure enough. Yeah. Okay, so it's a great follow-up to our studies in Revelation, and we hope that you're going to continue to join us and tag along with us right here. <coughs> at uh, homechurch.us and are right here in our family room. So we just want to invite you to come, invite a friend to join in as well. And we hope to see you next week, same time.